Welcome everyone. We're going to get started in just a moment or two. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us in honor of Earth Day. We are so glad to have you with us. For those of um, you joining us for the first time, welcome to City Awake. My name is Blair Hollis, and I'm the head of institutional relations at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. In my role, I oversee the museum's corporate foundation and government relationships, and I serve on the City Awake advisory board. City Awake is the young professional platform of the Boston Chamber. Through our City Awake programming, we do work to elevate young professional voices to engage in the most pressing issues facing our region. With City Awake, we get to celebrate the incredible young talent in greater Boston, like today's panelists, and I'm very excited to be able to open today's program. Today's discussion is important as we will be hearing about how the next generation can advocate for climate readiness to become a priority within their communities, industries, and companies. These conversations could not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors, the Barr Foundation and John Hancock. Before we get started, I wanna flag that this webinar is being recorded and will be shared on the Chamber's YouTube page in the coming weeks. I want to encourage you to use the chat and Q&A functions during today's conversation. We want to be sure that we can answer as many of your questions as we can today. Since both of our speakers um, are, come from a little bit of a different background, I thought I would let you both introduce yourselves and provide a snapshot of your current role and background. First, let's welcome Kalila Barnett, Program Officer for Cl Climate Resilience at the Barr Foundation. Welcome, Kalila. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be a part of the conversation today. Would you like to say a couple words about your background and <laughs> sure, your role? Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm a program officer at the Barr Foundation, a part of the climate program, um, which is, uh, and my particular role is focused on um, addressing climate resilience. I've been um, in this role for about three years. Um, and our focus is really on increasing the capacity of um, our region, the Metro Boston region, to prepare for and adapt to climate change um, while promoting equitable solutions. Um, and one of the exciting parts of my work is getting to hear from grantees, um, community-based organizations, municipalities, intermediaries, who are really in the thick of trying to figure out how do we implement, uh, implement all of these plans that we have for making our region more climate resilient and making sure that everyone in our communities is really prepared uh, for what is happening now and what is to come. Wonderful, thank you. And Ali, would you like to introduce yourself? Hey, good morning. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. I'm Ali Sherwood. I'm the Associate Director of Boston Waterfront and Corporate Partnerships with the Trustees of Reservations, also known as the Trustees. Um, I work across multiple teams at the Trustees to help our partners create a positive impact um, in our communities. And that is definitely the, the best part of my job is that opportunity to work with both corporate and community partners to really catalyze change and have a positive impact. Thank you both for being with us today. And I'm really excited to dive in with some questions and then we'll open up for Q&A from our audience. Um, so to start with an opening question for both of you, climate change is a principal risk facing businesses, economies and societies around the world today. 
in terms of both likelihood and the severity of potential impact. Climate change is also connected to the risks of global water and food crises, extreme weather events causing major uh, property infrastructure and environmental damage. And my hope for today's conversation is that we can learn about how the next generation can advocate for climate readiness to become a priority. So with all of that in mind, um, why do you believe it is important that Boston's business community become more climate resilient, ready, and more informed? And I'm happy to have whichever one of you would like to start, go ahead. Kalila, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, sure, I can start. I mean, I think when I when thinking about this question, a few things come up for me. Um, one is that it's happening, <laughs> so that climate change is real, and we are already seeing impacts um, in the greater Boston region uh, related to climate change. So, in some ways, you know, any savvy business has to be have it, have an understanding of what's happening externally, and this is one of the factors that businesses are going to have to contend with. In some cases, some of these businesses may own property. Um, and it is important to think about for your assets, how do you maintain them? How do you make sure that the workers and you know the mechanics and the machinery, like all of those things are safe from, um, from climate impacts. And so it is a prudent business decision, I think, at this at this moment. Um, the other thing I would say is that businesses are an imp are important stakeholders in our local economy and in our communities, and so it is important to hear the voice of leadership um, as mm -hmm. we all kind of make this transition um, into uh, a better a better future. Yeah, Khalil, I. I I'm with you on that one, you know, our, our leadership and business really has the capacity to catalyze change in our in our communities on many levels. And as the awareness of climate change has increased and re really increasingly accepted as a global issue and a real business issue, you know, companies really can't sit on the sidelines anymore, nor are they choosing to. Um, you know, I think businesses are acknowledging that climate change is not just a CSR issue, but a really holistic business issue, Khalil, as I hear you saying here. Um, and they're devising the business practice accordingly. Um, and I think companies that, that get their strategy right, like so many that we see in the Boston area, uh, really have that opportunity for creating social good as well as for business and profit. Mm -hmm. Certainly, hopefully we'll be seeing more and more change. And Kalila, in, you have over a decade of experience in community organizing around affordable housing, land development, and environmental justice. Um, throughout your career, you've had an agenda to address climate change and environmental issues. What are some of the initiatives that you were part of um, shaping um, with community members around climate justice? Yeah. Um... I guess one of the one of the um, kind of foundational campaigns that ACE, um, my previous organization, was involved in that continues to have impacts to this day, um, is our work around asthma and air quality. And um, we know that a lot of air pollution comes from fossil fuels, from um, you know, from sources that are emitting greenhouse gases, and you know, they are those gases are warming our planet, but they are also um, negatively impacting the health of communities. And so, um, like many other EJ groups, one of the things that we've worked on, or that we worked on at the time, was addressing the asthma crisis in communities. Um, and in particular, um, around Nubian Square at the time, there was a large bus depot um, that was owned and operated by the MBTA. Um, Nubian Square is a big bus hub on the MBTA, MBTA system. And at the time, it was mostly a diesel bus fleet. So this we're talking about, um, you know, over a decade ago, a diesel bus fleet right in a residential neighborhood. So when those buses would get fired up in the mornings, you know, they're emitting clouds of black smoke, you know, all day long. And we would hear from residents about having to close their windows because they would be getting soot uh, on their kitchen tables or on, you know, other surfaces in their homes um, from, from the diesel emissions. And so, you know, we approached that as saying, okay, um, this is, you know, one of the a major sources of, of, of pollutants in our neighborhood. 
we still need these buses. So how do we um, encourage and push the MBTA and what we now know as MassDOT, it wasn't called MassDOT at the time, you know, to clean up their bus fleet. And so, um, you know, we were successful in those efforts and there, you know, obviously we're, you know, sort of reaping the benefits of that organizing effort. Um, but one of the things that I think is particularly exciting about that, um, that approach of like talking with the community and getting them engaged in the work is we found out that people were also um, concerned about the service that they were receiving on the bus. You know, is your bus coming on time? Is it allowing you to get to school and to work and to doctor's appointments? And by talking from a community level of saying, okay, we wanna think about the asthma crisis, we learned about um, another challenge that folks were facing and that transformed into what is now the T Riders Union and really, you know, decades long more of advocacy around um, the MBTA system and um, advocating for first class service for bus riders and folks that live in environmental justice communities. So I think that's just one example of the ways in which a real community based approach can help you to address a number of issues and really change the system. That's such a great example, and I can only imagine it's become more and more important during COVID too, thinking about um, our air quality in the city. And uh, switching gears a little bit to think about the waterfront, uh, Allie, in your role as Associate Director of Partnership for the Trustees, you work on the organization's plans to create climate resilient open spaces along the waterfront. Um, so what are some of the plans that you have worked on with different private, nonprofit, government, and community partners? Yeah, so we've been we've been really lucky to have really strong partnerships with a number and variety of entities. Um, we have certainly a very strong leadership body within the trustees called our One Waterfront CEO Roundtable, which is a cohort of 12 CEOs from companies in and around Boston. Uh, we work with the Boston Waterfront Partners led by Kalila's organization, the Bar Foundation. Uh, and that's a partnership of organizations working together to make sure that the waterfront is open and inviting and vibrant for all. And the for all part of that is very, very crucial to the work that we're doing here. Um, and we also work with e community partners such as East Boston Neighborhood Health Center in East Boston, where our first site on the One Waterfront Initiative is actively taking shape right now. Um, and that collaboration with you know, those trusted community leaders who are very deep in the community really helps us to understand the unique challenges and the pressures and the risks that are incurred by a particular population in a neighborhood. Very much like the, the example that Kalila just shared, um, there are always specific pressures in a neighborhood and we want to work and understand those and then work to address them. Um, and likewise, we have good city and state both communication and collaboration to make sure that the work that we're doing is adding value um, to resilience plans and projects that are all always taking shape, um, making sure, you know, we're all kind of going in the same direction. Great. And building on those two um, really good examples of work that's being done in the city of Boston, um, it points to the fact that there is no one size fits all approach to climate change and different industries or geographic locations are going to have to come up with unique solutions. So as part of that sort of two questions for both of you, um, what are the basic strategies every business should consider and why when approaching this work and how should employers approach their different stakeholders, be it employees, shareholders or customers when it comes to business operations and climate readiness and Kalila, why don't you start. Sure. Um, so one thing that I, I think about in relationship to this question is that is partly, you know, kind of what we've been naming is that um, businesses can and should see themselves as leaders um, within this work um, in, in, in municipalities and in the region. So one, that they are leaders. And then in terms of thinking about your own business or your own organization, um, it's really important that uh, the folks who are at the top are on board. So, you know, thinking about the presidents, the CEOs, the COOs, you know, if something is really going to take hold within um, any kind of organization, it's important that the leaders are like really echoing that and championing that work. I think the other, um, the other piece that I think about is it's important to understand how 
the different constituencies that interact with your business are where they're situated. So, you know, employees are going to have a particular understanding, a particular set of interests. Um, shareholders are going to have a particular understanding, a particular interest. And so as any entity is kind of creating plans, um, embrace that complexity and, you know, find the areas of overlap and there may be some areas of disconnect. But um, I think, you know, the idea that we're going to have some, every business is going to have kind of like a fixed plan, you know, and if we just follow this plan, everything is going to work out fine. No, like conditions are going to change over time. What we know is going to change over time. Uh, and so it's important that uh, you create uh, um, kind of mechanisms within your business to be able to talk about those changes and adapt to them over time because this is going to be an iterative process. Um, so it's really important that um, that folks grow their capacity to be able to do that. Yeah. Kalila, so well said. Embrace the complexity. I think you know that <laughs> can be a little bit scary. You know, this is this yeah. is a journey, and like you say, it is definitely not a one size fits all plug and play situation. And I think really understanding the direct and indirect impacts and your stakeholders is absolutely key. And I think fundamentally, every business and really every person within the company can really increase their fluency in resilience and sustainability. Um, and those small daily actions that really in practice contribute to larger change because it is complex and there is no quick fix, but there are small things that really, really add up. Um, so thinking big picture, understanding how climate change can impact business, taking action to mitigate, but definitely embrace that complexity. It's going to be messy. It's going to be a journey. <laughs> yeah, and I think that, you know, Boston is really lucky in that there are many organizations that are focused on climate and the intersection of like business and community interests, mm -hmm. like the trustees and other waterfront partners that I think are are willing and able to, to partner with corporations mm -hmm. and other types of businesses to help them like navigate yeah. okay practically, you know, what what yes. does this mean? <laughs> yeah, that's that's absolutely true. And it's really wonderful to see the leaders in our business community, you know, creating that space and that opportunity to discuss these things, learn from each other and you know, keep evolving. Yeah. So it's great to hear what's happening at the organizational level and sort of top down, but I'd like to switch gears to talk a little bit about more grassroots and um, Khalila, what would you say to people who are entering activist spaces and looking to government officials for solutions regarding climate change and how can people on the ground push agendas forward? Yeah. Um, so my background is in community organizing. So I think, you know, the better organized you are, the better you're able to build power and uh, wield that power to influence decision makers. So I would definitely encourage folks who are interested to figure out how you can become connected to other individuals and other organizations that are already um, operating in your community. And for some folks that may look like, you know, community-based organizations that do have a membership model and do organizing like ACE in Roxbury or Green Roots in Chelsea and East Boston. Um, and in other cases, it may, um, may look like becoming a member of the trustees and, you know, participating in the array of, um, of activities that they, they do on an annual basis to connect people to the waterfront and, you know, all sorts of other great things. I think um, it is, yeah, so, f you know, connecting your area of interest and expertise and, you know, serving as a volunteer in those spaces. I think the other um, the other piece that comes up for me around this is um, climate change is not uh, only it's a problem in, on multiple levels, you know, and, and a symptom I think of a larger set of issues. And you know, one of the arenas that's really important to make progress on is the political arena because ultimately, elected officials, policymakers need to decide. Um, about 
how development is going to happen or where it's not going to happen or what buildings, you know, need to be retrofitted, et cetera. And so there is a big rate, you know, a number of races happening in Boston and, you know, next year in the state. And so look to, you know, the political candidates you think who are, are, are most closely aligned with your values as they relate to climate change and explore opportunities there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Khalil, I could not agree more with everything you just said. I think, you know, I'm, I'm going to start in the, in the reverse order, but definitely the elections that are coming up, um, you know, there's there's a lot of change and shifts happening on the, the city level in the city of Boston. And there will be a number of forums for these candidates to declare their stances on really critical issues, including the waterfront. Um, so paying attention to that, getting involved, you know, making sure that you have a good idea of where the candidates stand on the issues that are important to each individual. Um, and likewise, getting involved in your neighborhood, um, whether it's planning processes in your neighborhood, you know, Climate Ready Boston, the Bar Waterfront Partners, you know, there are so many ways, all the, the organizations you mentioned, Kalila, you know, we work with those organizations as well to make sure that the trustees are understanding the community stance and the needs and the where where folks are advocating for change. Mm -hmm. Plugging in and engaging there, it's sometimes those grassroots and hyper-local organizations, those really do inform decisions made on, on multiple levels. For sure. And it has been so great to see different announcements around the country today in honor of Earth Day from different politicians and sort of how that, that work is continuing to build momentum. Mm -hmm. um, Allie, I would love to hear more about the trustees' new climate resilient equitable parks and specifically in East Boston. And so it would be great if you could tell us about this site and what kind of design elements you're exploring to help buffer storm surge and sea level rise. Yes, absolutely. So the trustees were really honored uh, to be the site developer for Piers Park 3. So we are currently in the community engagement and design phase for a parcel that is adjacent to the existing Piers Park in East Boston. It's on Marginal Street and Eastie right along the water. Um, so that under the One Waterfront Initiative, there are a few sites that we have been investigating around Boston Harbor. Um, that we're looking at particularly vulnerable flood entry points um, where we can perhaps have an innovative reuse of an existing structure. And Pierce Park 3 really fits all of those parameters. Um, the site is a particularly vulnerable flood entry point into the neighborhood that's situated behind Pierce Park. Um, and likewise, it's a really interesting spot for an industrial reuse project. So as the pier currently exists, it is um, a former shipping pier that included a railroad spine down the pier. Um, it was used to load goods onto ships that were bound for other corners of the globe. Um, it has not been in use for many years. It's in a state of disrepair. Um, so in the interest of bringing an open world-class park that really is meant to bring open space and accessible, inclusive programming to that neighborhood that's really meant to be not just for East Boston, but the surrounding communities and certainly every neighborhood in Boston. Um, we are now asking the community what they want. We're working with multiple partners, including our own community liaison, who is conducting outreach. We're doing surveys and community meetings. Um, we conduct our community meetings separately in English and in Spanish to try to reach as many people as we can within East Boston, really asking what those priorities are. What would you like to see in Boston in, at Piers Park? So we're certainly thinking through the green infrastructure and how we can add value to climate resilience goals within Boston. So we are thinking all soft edges reintroducing native ecologies, certainly resilience um, is a huge part of this space. Um, we're lucky enough to be working with the design team who constructed, designed and constructed Brooklyn Bridge Park in New York, a very similar premise of an industrial reuse project that was actually able to, wow, withstand six days of inundation following Hurricane Sandy because of those native ecologies and resilient plantings that were used also did a pretty good job of protecting the population behind it. So we're very excited and looking forward to this iterative 
design process that is fully informed by, by our community's voice. No, well, it's so exciting to hear. I wasn't, I didn't have the, until now, the latest update about that project. And it's really exciting to hear that. I think, um, you know, one of my many lessons that I've learned over the past year is just how important quality open space is for yes. a community. I mean, both, yeah. right, that, that is, those have been the spaces where we've been able to safely gather, mm -hmm. you know, family members and other loved ones. And it is also something, you know, when I think about my work at ACE and, and other EJ work across the country is, is people talk about, you know, the need to have quality open space and the lack mm -hmm. thereof, um, you know, in black and brown communities. So it's just critical. Another um, learning I think we can all agree on from this past year is how important technology has really become to our lives and so embedded in it. Um, and recently the chamber hosted a conversation with local technology leaders um, who reminded us that technology will continue to be an integral part of our society moving forward. And so what innovation technology related opportunities have been investigated to adapt to climate change? And this is for both of you. So whoever wants to dive in. Khalil, you've been, you've been speaking up first here. <laughs> um, so I think for, for us, we see a lot of modeling and monitoring technologies that will help us really accurately plan for the future of the Boston Harbor front. Um, certainly there are innovative physical barriers, like those green spaces we can design digitally. We can go through various iterations um, without, you know, it's a very cost-effective way to approach it. Um, I do think that real solutions are going to be an integration of those innovative and technological opportunities, really, though, embedded in institutional change. So I'm putting my money on both of those things simultaneously. Mm. Yeah, I think that um, a lot of the, the technological things that we have supported have been under, as Ali was mentioning, under like the modeling you know, doing projections. Um, and so I think it's important that those tools mature and that, um, and really that municipalities gain the capacity over time to like effectively use them. I think one of the, um, one of the challenges is the cost of doing those things. So, you know, municipalities like Boston, for example, do have the resources to purchase, to, you know, to, and to, to use those tools, but other smaller cities and towns may not. And so I think um, it would be great to think about, okay, how do we make sure that as many places as possible have access to quality data and quality information upon which to make decisions? Yeah, Khalila, that's a really good point because that the technology might exist, but then there's, you know, a barrier to implementing or using it I think that's a really great space for corporate partners to come in and help with skills-based volunteering where they can provide, you know, a path and, and or remove an obstacle is probably a better way to say it, um, to accessing that technology and the myriad benefits that it would allow a smaller municipality who might not have those resources. Yeah. And Clearly, you spoke a little bit th about this in regards to the last um, question around open green spaces and access to those resources. Um, but the pandemic has reminded us of, in many ways, the extreme inequalities embedded in our culture and our society. And so how do we seize this moment to address not only environmental problems, but also larger societal issues where and when we can? That's a big question. Um, and how can employers bring an equity lens to their own climate readiness work? So clearly, yeah. maybe if you want to start, and then I want to hear from Allie too. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those are definitely big and important questions that uh, I don't have all figured out. <laughs> um, I think no one does. Um, so, you know, I think part of it goes back to um, how we are how we are understanding what the problem is that we're trying to address and how we, you know, understand climate change um, and, you know, what, what we call climate change work. And sort of what I mean by that is, um, you know, as part of what we've been discussing is that, um, you know, there is 
part of resolving this is a science uh, technological approach. So understanding the data, looking at the projections and figuring out how do we adapt for that. But then we also have to remember we are doing this work in service of our lives as people and, you know, to preserve our well-being. And if we focus too much on, you know, what are the hazards going to be, somehow people kind of get extracted, you know, from that. And so how do we, how do we really center people in these conversations? And so if you're able to think about um, people, then you have to also understand that climate change is happening to all of us, but people are going to be impacted, are being impacted very differently. So if you're from a community that has, you know, less green space, less mm -hmm. trees, your neighborhood is going to be hotter in the summer. And we know that extreme heat is something that, that kills people. Uh, and, calls, and causes a myriad of health issues. And so we need to really understand how different people are situated um, in, in regards to the problem. Mm -hmm. And if we do that, then we're able to make connections to, um, to racial justice. Then we're able to make connections to economic inequality by, by focusing and centering people's experience and not just you know sort of technology or science. Yeah, definitely, Khalil. I think centering humans, you know, here, and you're absolutely right. We don't have all the answers, don't have it all figured out. And this is another place where it's it certainly will be a, a journey. But, you know, listening to, to your words, Khalil, really resonant because I think, you know, cultivating equity includes a transitioning of power, right? And giving voice to those who are most impacted and ensuring that they are heard. And you know, companies can listen and hear you know, the priorities of these communities as they're being presented by the folks who, who live there or who work there or who mm -hmm. exist in that space. And I think also being open to adjusting company priorities predicated on what they're hearing, because those can be really different. You know, I think CSR can go in one direction, but then when you hear a community out, it might be a completely different situation. I think you have to be willing to adjust those things. Um, we definitely don't have all the answers, but I think, yeah, generally staying true to principles and the mission and hearing, listening and hearing and intentionally, maybe simultaneously learning and unlearning together yeah. is kind of the, the right direction. Yeah, the unlearning is always, it goes hand in hand with the learning. Yeah, and, and being able to... Um, to do that over time, right? Like, you know, this is not, yes. this is not an equation that, <laughs> you know, a fixed equation, right? It's really, you know, building adaptive capacity over time. Right, definitely. And I think part of that adaptive capacity is really acknowledging and respecting that different people, different companies are in different places along that timeline and that adaptation and that, you know, this, this is collective work and it is going to take, it's going to take time. Yeah. Thinking about um, corporate social responsibility a little bit more, how much do you both think that employees are paying attention to their employer's stances on public policy issues like climate change? And do you think it might be a strategy to retain and attract talent for employers? Or it's been interesting to see what's been happening in Atlanta over the past couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. I think, yes. That is a that is a big yes that folks are paying attention, and especially the younger generation in the workforce is really paying attention, and it's a it's a strategy to attract and retain talent uh, because you know I think at this point we're all we have a little bit more space to show up authentically at work and not separate out our our personal values and priorities from the work that we do. So you know the more that an employer can allow that space for discussion, learning and unlearning, and, you know, progress together. I think that there, it's a huge strategy for business to attract and retain talent. Definitely. I think, um, and part of that work includes, you know, not 
shying away from from the tough conversations that need to happen. I mean, you know, talking about racial justice and climate justice requires um, sometimes hearing some hard truths about, about you know, your impact, but embracing that because ultimately it can help to make you a stronger organization. Um, And I think that, you know, we have seen um, over the course of the past several years uh, at different moments where employee groups, you know, within some of the large tech firms and other places are saying, hey, you know, we think that you know, our company's response to X issue is inadequate. And, yep. you know, we are going to verbalize that through a walkout or or what mm-hmm. have you. I mean, employees need to decide what, are, you know, what's appropriate for the mm-hmm. conditions that they're interacting with. But I think, you know, we're definitely in a place where um, hopefully people are feeling um, able to, to, to talk <laughs> um, and to express, you know, express their opinions and ideals. Mm-hmm. And th- those are important, you know, values when you're seeking out a workplace. Um, you know, you really, you mm-hmm. want to be able to to feel at home and feel like, you know, you're moving together with um, a place that you're spending so much of your time, <laughs> so much of your life. Yeah, that's that's a really good point to Khalil about we see that very often with groups with whom we partner inside of companies. They can drive change. Yes, it definitely needs to be from the top as well, but these groups on any level in the in the company composed of employees with similar interests and a mission, they're really driving change. You know, and I think that that certainly matters too. I know some of the questions I ask if I'm thinking about, you know, a new partner or, you know, whatever it might be, those are always top of mind questions about the resources that are available and the avenues for employees to to lend their voice and be heard. Yeah. So I'm going to start um, with some of some the questions that we've gotten from the audience because we have some really great ones. And I love this first one because so much of the conversation we've had so far is Boston-centric because for obvious reasons, we're all based in Boston and we're part mm-hmm. of that community. But are there other cities or towns across the state or the U.S. that are really great examples of leading the charge in um, climate readiness? So, yes, uh, there are a number of places across, really across the globe um, that are are leading the charge. I know we're learning from, particular to the One Waterfront Initiative, we're learning from places like Toronto that's done a really fantastic job of implementing green industrial reuse projects and bringing residents and visitors in the workforce closer to a working port, you know, very much like we have here in Boston. Um, there are a number of open spaces in Toronto that welcome the public. Um, I think we we really do look to New York for great examples of green, open, resilient space and actually correlated programming that really effectively it welcomes everyone. And I really do mean everyone. Um, you know, there's been a few projects in Houston that have created linear open green space uh, where it previously did not exist. Um, so we, there are so many places, San Francisco too, there's, I can think of a lot of examples that were really also fueled by public-private partnerships, which that's a really important facet of the conversation is you know, certainly how we're gonna build this and fund it in a fiscally responsible way. And I think we can look to a lot of those examples around around the country and certainly around the globe. Yeah, I think um, for me, what came up when you asked that question was um, heat um, and also um, dealing with sea level rise. And so um, Miami is a place, um, there's a number of, um, of organizations there, government, you know, and, you know, public and private organizations working on addressing sea level rise, you know, Miami is extremely vulnerable for, you know, reasons that, you know, we don't have to go into, but I think that, um, you know, the city and the county have really taken that on. I'm kind of jealous of places that have county government (laughs) Um, uh, because we could use that here. I think that would be really, you know, helpful for for addressing climate issues. So Miami is one of those places. 
the city of Philadelphia did uh, a really good heat community-based heat plan a couple of years ago that I refer back to often and hear about the ways in which they were able to mobilize and support community action to addressing extreme heat. Um, the city of Providence, uh, I think probably now, maybe two years ago, adopted um, a climate justice plan after using um, a collaborative governance model where you know residents were decision makers along with elected officials and mm -hmm. policymakers to design a plan for their port area and other you know other um, uh, historically marginalized parts of the city. So you know that for sure. Um, yeah, those are those are a couple of places that come to mind. Yeah, I think I, I will drop in a, a plug here for a One Waterfront resource. It's our, we have a One Waterfront blog that's available through our website. Signing up for that, you get a weekly email. We very often profile parks we love, which achieve you know what we're talking about here, but also other open spaces, community partners. And it's basically another window and another way to get exposure to this work that's being done pretty much around the world. Thank you both. Um, another, I'm getting a whole list of questions, which is wonderful. <laughs> so I'm going to keep rolling through them. Um, so I am a young analyst with a passion for climate change, and I'm trying to transition to a career in environmental sustainability slash renewable energy. What mm -hmm. advice would you give to students or recent graduates who want to be involved full time and ways to make connections in the industry? Great question. So I think it's get out there and get involved and don't be shy. I think, you know, that's whether it's groups like City Awake or the any one of the chamber networking events, getting involved on the neighborhood level. I mean, Kalila, you mentioned some, some grassroots organizations. I think that would probably be good conduits. So I think connecting and which I also helps understand kind of the issues and approach and speak up. You know, get in there, roll up your sleeves and get in there. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, there are, in, in addition to what Ali mentioned, there are some um, coalitions or places where different nonprofit organizations are, are uniting around um, a climate change mm -hmm. agenda. Um, and so there is, uh, you know, a Massachusetts Green New Deal committee. And so just, you know, a search for that, you know, will give you a list of organizations that they're that are engaged. And mm -hmm. so as you're thinking about new career opportunities or places to become a monthly donor or what have you, or you know, participate in different activities, that yep. could be, you know, kind of one way, um, one way to approach it. Um the, you know, the Green Ribbon Commission is obviously is very well known, um, you know, to the folks that are uh, on the, a part of the conversation today. So those businesses, those companies, those are places that are already said, we think this is important, you know, and we want to do something about it. Perhaps that's also another possibility, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of looking for jobs or, or areas or opportunities to support. Yep. I think too, one of the, I know one of the things that was really helpful for me, um, there, there's really no separation between the social side of things and the professional side of things for me. And, you know, there's a lot of groups that kind of mix the two, you know, the Environmental League of Massachusetts does monthly dinners focused on environmental issues. So it's kind of a chance to network. It's a loose format, but it's always a learning experience, but it's just an opportunity to talk with people, make connections, um, and you know, keep building that network. Mm -hmm. All right, another question. How can we as employees push our companies on their ESG goals, especially environmental? Is there something we can do as individuals or good examples you would reference? Hmm. I'm thinking of examples. <laughs> you know, I, from my work with our partners, I think, certainly voicing that uh, that opinion, those concerns, those questions. And it may take a few times, like we've been talking about. It's not a straight line. It is definitely a journey. Um, and I think acknowledging that the company may be on a different place in the journey, but also maintain those expectations that you know there, there will be movement and improvement and 
that could be the starting point of an environmental resource group within the company if one does not exist. So I'd say, you know, don't, don't limit yourself if something isn't there, you could be the catalyst. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense to me on how to approach it. And I think, um, you know, just again, just kind of recognizing, like, I think part of how you think about it is, um, is doing some kind of thinking or analysis about like what, who, what is your company? What is its, you know, mission and work? And like, what are the ways in which, you know, what you would like to see them do more of or stop doing or do better, you know, has a relationship to that. I think that could be an important way to, to, to craft a message, you know, that you could bring Mm -hmm. to your supervisor or, you know, to whatever, um, you know, whatever conversations are being organized or, you know, create the space, um, you know, for those conversations to happen, as Ali was mentioning, you know, it, 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 yeah, it feel this does feel like a moment to be unafraid. Yes, <laughs> like, what yes. You have to lose, you know, be unafraid. Yeah, and clearly, I think that's a really that's a really smart approach. Is you know that that tactical approach of you know wrapping your concerns back to the value proposition of the business. How does this impact business? And or in the big picture, you know, business, your relationship with vendors, your supply chain overall. How will climate change impact business? You know, looking at it in the really big picture, you know, makes it, it's hard to ignore, you know? Mm-hmm. And we actually just got a question that was, how can big organizations like Staples get involved? And I think, Ali, your um, answer, your thoughts right there just answered that perfectly. Um, and I love that the questions and also answers that you both have been giving have been so action oriented. So another one sort of in that vein Um, As the future of public goods like the waterfront are becoming shaped and made to be more climate resilient, accessible, inclusive, and welcoming, how do we center people in the planning process so that these shared spaces are designed and programmed to benefit the many instead of the few? Love, love, love that question. So I would certainly welcome, and this is another resource that can be found on our website. Um, We have a community platform for feedback on the One Waterfront website. Please Go there, have a look at the plans, and leave your feedback. Um, We also post the community engagement sessions. Um, We welcome everyone to these. And this is something where you could even take that link and share it within your company to get more folks to participate and elevate the visibility of both this work, but conceptually, the the work that's embedded in this very specific project. So we're, we, have many mechanisms available. And you'll find these within a lot of community organizations. I think Khalil of the Waterfront Partners and you know, there are mm-hmm. the other, found, other avenues that the Bar Foundation has created um, because that bar does an incredible job of removing barriers for the community. So I think there's, there's always a way to lend your voice to the conversation. Totally agree. And I think um, there's an opportunity to think about engaging even beyond the waterfront. So, you know, that obviously that's a huge, that's a huge area of concern and interest for a lot of people. And um, there are smaller development projects that are happening with the neighborhoods. You know, the one that Ali mentioned in Chris Park, there is a planning process going on right now for Franklin Park, which is the park that I grew up going to in Boston. Um, and so, you know, think about what's closest to you. Where are the places that you're going that you really yep. care about, you know, where you live and work? And chances mm-hmm. are somebody's making some decisions about what resources are going to be allocated for maintenance of that space or renovation. And it's important that your voice be heard. Yeah, definitely. That, like Khalil is saying, that na- that planning process is happening on the neighborhood level. It's always happening on the neighborhood level, whether it's Boston or wherever you might be located. And I think getting involved there absolutely is a wonderful starting point. And I have my last audience question and then I'll have a um, closing question and final thoughts from you both. But so our last audience question, the big headlines today are about Biden committing the U.S. to cutting greenhouse gas emissions in half by 2030. A New York Times headline says climate change could cut world economy by 23 trillion in 2050. Insurance giant Swiss Ray warns. What are your thoughts on these two headlines? 
So I'll say it again, um, because it's kind of a long question. So the, the first <laughs> headline being um, the New York Times saying uh, Biden's going to cut climate um, admission by half by 2030, and then um, an insurance giant, Swiss Re, warning that it could cut the world economy by 23 billion trillion. Yeah, I guess a couple of things. Um, from my perspective, um, climate change is a symptom um, that tells us that the way in which we are living and working and being on the planet um, mm -hmm. is not sustainable. And so that means that um, to some extent, our current conceptions of like what our economy is and how it functions are going to need to change to live within <laughs> the, uh, the level of resources that we have on this planet. And so, um, you know, I think it is the role of, you know, large international institutions, like the ones you mentioned to sort of say, oh my gosh, you know, sort of like, mm -hmm. if we do this, it's going to, it's going to, you know, cut the economy. Um, at the same time, um, cut the economy for whom? There are many people under this current economy who are struggling, who don't have what they need. Um, to, to really prosper. And so I think as we, it's important that um, we dig in, you know, kind of beneath some of those headlines and understand um, what those folks are trying to preserve and a way of being and working that from my perspective has not benefited everyone equally. And so um, that's one thing. And then I also just, you know, want to mention that I think there's a real opportunity in how the Biden administration, it's not a perfect plan, but the ways in which, um, you know, trying to reframe what infrastructure means and also like yes. addressing climate change does not have to be in competition with having a growing and thriving economy. <laughs> like, and, 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 and I think it's, you know, it's easy to kind of, just say, oh, we can't do this because of how complicated it is. And, but we have to do it, but we have to do it because the changes are here and they are happening. And um, if we get out ahead of it, if we think about ways to, you know, justly transition our current economy into one that's in alignment with how the planet works, we will all benefit from that. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to say it any better than you just said, Kalila, but I think this also goes back to the concept of embracing the complexity. It is neither this nor that. There's not only two choices here. I think that a sustainable way forward really integrates climate strategies, climate smart infrastructure, resilience tools, and the economy will adapt. Yes, it may have an impact on the structure that exists at this present moment. And, you know, headlines are sometimes a little bit incendiary trying to get a reaction out of you, right? So there will be analysis that follows when we talk about that big picture look at how climate change will impact business. You know, when you really take the time and dig in, as you say, clearly, you dig in to really figure out what the, the true story is here. I think when we look at the long-term projections of business impact, if we maintain the economy in its current state and direction and the not really moving in the direction of greener solutions. Yeah, I think that will have a more significant impact to business and economy than if we just keep on keeping them. Yeah. So our last final uh, closing question, as young professionals are growing to become the world's, uh, the largest working generation and decision makers of our business community, what type of change do you hope to see? So um, can young professionals feel optimistic or empowered when thinking about Boston and our nation's future in the midst of a dis difficult time in our nation's history in many ways? I mean, I hope to see a lot of change. <laughs> you know, I think I, I feel very optimistic and very hopeful, even in the, the trajectory and the changes I, I see happening. 
Um, I will be the first to admit sometimes it doesn't happen on the timeline I would like it to happen on, and it can be a little bit easy to, to feel discouraged. But, you know, in general, I really do see change, and I, I feel hopeful for and how young professionals will further this and catalyze that change in that ability to show up authentically at work and integrate your personal principles into your work and leaders in the business community providing the space and the time to learn and unlearn and hear and you know really put resources behind driving true honest social change as well as evolving business yeah i think that um being being an optimist is a choice. And I think that um, maybe you can't choose it every day. I know I can't, <laughs> not, or I am not choosing it every day, but um, I wouldn't I wouldn't be doing the work that I'm doing if I didn't have some sense that, okay, you know, what we want to achieve is is possible. Um, and um, and and we don't, um, we have to do it. We have to do it. And so I think that um, with, you know, a younger workforce, I think that does make me more, um, that does make me more hopeful and more optimistic because I think there's a way in which um, younger folks have, are just less encumbered by, um, <laughs> by the past because, haven't been around as long, but also I think, you know, really, especially over the past several years, you know, witnessing the ways in which um, the systems that we've created are not, um, are not serving everyone um, or, or are serving in a way that, that Mark continues to marginalize, you know, folks and, and damage lives. And so I think there's a ton of opportunity to recreate our economy recreate our ways of being with each other and with the planet. And um, that, that vision, that aspiration is, is really inspiring. And, you know, I hear that most when I'm talking to, to younger folks. That is such an inspiring and powerful sentiment to take with us as we end this conversation. And Ali, did you want to say one more thing? I saw you unmute. Nope. nope. Um, nope. No. I'm, I'm I want to leave it right where Khalil is. Right there. <laughs> that was perfect. That was such a perfect closing. Um, so thank you both so much for being with us today and providing such valuable insight. We really appreciate your time. Um, before we close, I do want to highlight the Chamber of Commerce and City Awake have a packed digital calendar coming up over the next few months. So on April 29th, we have a women's network event, imposter syndrome, silencing self-doubt. That sounds fun. <laughs> and in May, we have the Chamber's annual meeting, which is the biggest event of the year. So we hope you'll join us um, and followed by another City Awake event focused on food insecurity, which I think dovetails nicely with the conversation we've been having. We are also currently accepting applications for our annual Fierce Urgency of Now Festival in the fall. It's a festival focused on connections, access, and exposure for young professionals of color. Uh, head to cityawake.org for more information. And with that, thank you to our panelists. Um, thank you both Khalila and Ali so much. And thank you everyone for joining us. Have a great afternoon. Thank you Hi, so thank much. Thank you. Great to talk with you, Ali. <laughs> you too. Take care. Bye-bye.